MLB Rundown, Fantasy Baseball Cafe's weekly video podcast. I'm your host, Josh Shepardson, also known as at BeachHead50 on Twitter. And I'm joined, as always, by my uh, partner in crime, so to speak, CBSSports.com's RJ White. How's it going, RJ? It's going good. How you doing? I'm doing really well. I'm just glad it's it's finally baseball season. It's been nice watching some afternoon games and uh, just kind of taking it all in. And speaking of afternoon games, how did you enjoy your uh, opening day trip uh, to watch the the Braves and Marlins play? For the most part, it was great. I mean, it's a it's a retractable roof stadium. Yet I still got rained on, so that was nice. <laughs> I um, forgot all about that. Wow, that that's that's a story that you will have to tell people forever that you had a rain delay in a retractable roof stadium. That that is that is something else. It was ridiculous. But the Braves got the win, so that's really all that matters. They're three and zero. They swept the Marlins, which is what they deserve for making me sit there in the rain. Um, <laughs> Are you pre-ordering so, World Series tickets yet? Uh, yeah, they're already. I'm sure they're already on the way. Excellent. Just what I wanted to hear. All right, moving on to more serious things. Uh, let me start off by saying excellent piece, uh, the Riding the Wave article that you submitted this week. Uh, that's where we're going to start talking today. Um, why don't you tell listeners a bit about that article and uh, so highlight some of the players that you uh, you discussed in it. Yeah, so I, I looked at some of the popular ads that people were making in fantasy leagues and, and kind of determined whether I think they're worth owning or not. Uh, starting with Jason Grilly, obviously he's the closer now. He's a must-own player in fantasy leagues. Um, for the teams that do have him, I'd give him about two months to establish himself and then look to try to sell high before the trading deadline because we know Atlanta is in a rebuild mode. Who knows what they're going to do if Grilly is throwing like a 1.9 ERA and, and 20 saves you know, by, by the trade deadline. They might look to move him. So I think it'd be good to sell high as we get toward late June, early July, just in case that happens. I'll step in, and, and uh, since we did talk about the Braves, I, I will confirm that this is not a homer pick. I, I am fully on board with Jason Grilly and agree with the uh, assessment completely. And I'll add that John Hart, I mean, it really seems like he knows what he's doing rebuilding. He did a great job with the Indians back in the day, and uh, I, I don't think he'll be shy to deal Grilly if he's pitching well. He obviously has an eye on the future, and rightfully so, and he's done a great job remaking the uh, Braves farm system. The next guy was Zach McAllister. He's he's been picked up in 42% of um, his seen his ownership rating rise in 42% of CBS leagues. I don't really understand why. I mean, he's had solid peripherals last year. He's a low upside guy. It's great that he won the, a rotation spot, but um, I'd only roster him as a matchup play. I don't see why why everybody's moving to grab him at this point. And yeah. Then I, the, oh, sorry. Uh, um, yeah, I, I mean, for me with McAllister. I, I look at him, and I'd be more inclined to roster him in, in large leagues if he were actually in the bullpen where his stuff played up. I think he could be a ratios helping reliever, um, not in the same class as Wade Davis, but in that, that vein where you're not expecting saves. But when his stuff played up last year out of the bullpen, he was very good. The problem is is he's not going to be able to rely strictly on a fastball and a slider from the rotation, and the fastball velocity is going to play down. So I, I'm with you. I don't really understand people – falling all over themselves to grab him. I, I get that it's nice that he's in the rotation and he has some security there, but um, I just don't see the upside of, of going out and racing out to grab him. The next most popular ad is Archie Bradley. Now, this is one I do understand. He's making his major league debut Saturday. He's un unlikely to snag a win. He's going against Clayton Kershaw. But he's a very intriguing high upside player this season. He's a top 10 prospect heading into 2014. He's still well considered uh, this year. Um, he still needs to conquer his control issues to reach his, his absolute high potential. But because he such a, has such a high ceiling, he's definitely worth owning in fantasy leagues. Yeah, I don't have much to add to that. I agree. Bradley ceiling is through the roof as, as one of the uh, more highly touted pitching prospects in the game. The next uh, most added player is Juris Familia. Um, he's worth owning in the short term. While he certainly has the ability to do a good job if locked into the close role, it's just too hard to predict the Mets' long-term plans in the bullpen at this point. With Mejia and Parnell lurking on the DL, any any one of the three could end up with the most saves in that bullpen, and I wouldn't be that surprised this year. Yeah, I, in complete agreement. I, I mean, of the group, I think I still like Parnell the most, but it is pretty much a mess. And uh, unlike some closer situations where it, it's it's option A or option B, this is a three-headed monster that could get kind of ugly. 
To the next we have Jake Lamb. He did a nice job in his first few games. He has the ability to contribute everywhere but steals. If he reaches his potential, he could probably be like a 300 hitter with 20 to 25 homers. That, that wouldn't be too far out, out of uh, the realm of possibility. Uh, because the ceiling is high, I like him over those guys like Casey McGee and David Freeze, who aren't likely to deviate from their past production all that much. Yeah, and it's interesting. To me, Lamb is uh, your your battle between stats-oriented people and, and scouting reports. I mean, the scouting reports are more good than great potential, but uh, the, all he's done is hit at every level of the minor league. So I, I think he's a good investment at this point. We know that Chase Field is, is great for, uh, for, for run production, and uh, I, I think that in itself helps helps Lamb's value significantly. So I would certainly roll the dice on him. And the last two players I mentioned as um, popular ads were Jesse Hahn and Kendall Graveman. Um, Jesse Hahn, I think, was worth grabbing for a two-start week as long-term viability in fantasy leagues really depends on the size of the league. I definitely wouldn't drop a non-injured starting pitcher I like better that I like better during draft season in order to pick him up at this point, um, but I can see using him as a matchup play. And then with Graveman, I actually really liked him heading into the season. I'm not going to completely reverse course on him after one bad start. I think he's definitely worth consideration as a relief-eligible starting pitcher in leagues where having that kind of player matters. It's interesting because I, I'm more bearish on Graveman than you and more bullish on Han, but the, the, point, the, the most important point uh, in there is that if you liked these guys during draft season – um, and or you like someone on your roster more than them during draft season, it's not uh, pressing to go out and make a, a drastic change this early. And I, I that, that'll tie in nicely to our, our talking points on the podcast today, actually. And then moving on to guys who are popular drops, um, I, I listed a few. Irvin Santana is the most popular drop. That's obvious. You know, he's, he's going to miss half the year because of the suspension. Doesn't need to be owned in anything but the deepest of AL only leagues. Uh, Joaquin Benoit was dropped. Um, you know, he also lost his closing role. So um, between him and Santana, neither one of them have as much fantasy value as they did when the season was about to start. So I can see dropping both of those players. Yeah, I mean, definitely. There's not much else to be said. Santana, um, even in deep leagues, unless we're, we're talking exceptionally deep and, and sizable benches, um, it's, it's really tough to roster him when he's going to miss half the season. And at, um, I believe towards the end of the suspension, I'm not 100% certain what, what the uh, rules are. I believe he can start a minor league rehab assignment just before that's up. Um, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that that is the case with, with a player like Santana. So at least you won't have to wait on a rehab assignment if that's the case, but it's really tough to, to roster a guy that's not DL eligible because he is suspended and will just eat up a, a bench spot for you. Mm-hmm. And then the next two players that, that have been mostly dropped are due to their roles, uh, Kevin Gosman and Tanner Rourke. Now, we knew Rourke was going to pitch out of the bullpen this season, so that with the leagues that he's being drafted, and I don't understand why the, those those teams drafted him in the preseason and then are dropping him now. Um, Kevin Gosman, of course, was competing for a, a rotation spot. He didn't win it. I think he actually might have um, value out of the bullpen once he gets that relief eligibility. If he gets back into the rotation, that could help his, his fantasy uh, standing in those leagues where you look for those relief-eligible starting pitchers. So I wouldn't cut Gaussman yet. I, I'd keep him on the bench. Rourke, I'm more okay with cutting uh, because I just don't see – he's not going to crack that rotation unless an injury happens. You know, there's no way he's going to perform his way into the rotation. I'm right there with you. Rourke feels like that classic uh, auto-select pick for some people. Either they timed out or maybe they didn't show up for the draft at all because it was it – was, very evident that he would not be in that rotation, and yet uh, he was fairly highly owned going into the season and, and is being uh, shown the door uh, on a ton of teams this year already. So uh, Gosman, love love the long-term upside, and uh, as you said, he it could actually be a blessing in disguise that he opens the year in that bullpen if he's going to pick up relief pitching eligibility, uh, as that can certainly help his value in some leagues where uh, you have some strict uh, SP and RP roles. And then the next guy that's been uh, mostly dropped is um, Danny Salazar, and that's obviously because he's starting the year in AAA. I still like his long-term upside. He's still got great talent. Um, he's going to be back with the team at some point this season and in the starting rotation. So if there is a bench spot in your team you can you can use on Salazar, I'd pick him up and stick him in that bench spot. Um, I can understand dropping him because he's not going to get any stats while in the minors for you, but I think he's a guy that should be on in a lot of fantasy leagues. 
Yeah, he's a guy that we both sung the praises of on the podcast. And as we talked about with, with Zach McAllister a little bit earlier, uh, McAllister just doesn't have a very high ceiling as a starter. Salazar's uh, significantly uh, outpaces his. And for a team like the Indians that projects to be in it until the end, maybe maybe uh, even a World Series favorite in some eyes out of the American League, you would think that that jolt of life possibly sooner rather than later from Salazar would be really appealing to them. Uh, drop McAllister into that bullpen role where his stuff plays up and uh, just kind of watch the dominoes fall where they may at that point. You've got to think that's their long-term plan with that situation. Um, the last guy that's been the most popular drop isn't surprising to me, but I know it's probably surprising to a lot of people. It's Willen Rosario, catcher for the, the Rockies. He wasn't expected to start a catcher for the Rockies, even though he was drafted like he was going to start a catcher. They they made it clear that Nick Hundley was going to be their starter at catcher, and Rosario was going to back up catcher, first base. I think they even wanted to try him some in the outfield. Um, fantasy owners are finally starting to catch on. He doesn't have an everyday role. He's worth keeping in two catcher leagues because he's still going to be productive in limited time, but um, he's not a guy you can rely on in one catcher leagues at this point. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, if if injury does crop up either to Morno, who certainly missed time with, with concussion issues in his career, or uh, ineffectiveness from Hundley or injury results and an opening behind the plate, then Rosario is going to be a very popular ad. But in the meantime, really, he can only be rostered in two catcher leagues at this point, as he just doesn't have that kind of value to be worth rostering in single catcher format. And then playing off that Rosario uh, situation, we're going to my ad recommendations. I was looking at guys who are available in at least 80% of CBSSports.com leagues who could help teams. And the one I looked at a catcher is Nick Hundley. He's only owned in 7% of leagues. Uh, Rosario is not the regular catcher. Hundley is. That's obviously a great offensive environment for hitters. Um, if he's getting 400 to 500 at-bats in Colorado, he's obviously a, a, a nice little option as a second catcher. I have him in a league as my second catcher where I'm waiting on Matt Wieters to come off the DL. Um, and I think when Wieters does come back, he might have built up enough value that I can flip him to some other team to get some other asset. Because in two catcher leagues, I think teams should be starting Nick Hundley. Absolutely. I mean, it, it goes without saying, but Coors Field is just a dreamy location for, for owning hitters. It does wonders for even mediocre hitters, and uh, it's hard to imagine Hundley not having some value in two catcher leagues just based on the depth of that lineup and the uh, run scoring environment. Uh, he's obviously not going to be a great road option all the time, but I mean, when you're talking about two catcher leagues, the options get pretty pretty ugly, and Hundley at least has a lot to uh, to like about him. And in this list of players, a lot of the guys I mentioned here are, are, are more end-of-roster flyers. Um, Hunley's obviously a special case because two catcher leagues, they can use him. Uh, in standard 12-team leagues, owners are likely to have varying options available that are better pickups than anyone listed in this group of players. For example, I like outfielders like Michael Taylor and Travis Snyder better than guys like Drew Stubbs and Jordan Schaefer, who I'll get to in a minute. But the one barely-owned player I think that's pretty intriguing in most leagues right now is Yonder Alonso. He doesn't strike out a whole lot. He saw a little power growth last year. He dealt with a very low BABIP, and I can can see him flipping that this year, finishing the season with like a 290 average, maybe 15 to 20 homers. He's a great corner infield option for leagues that, that have a 14 batter lineup. So I definitely make sure he'd be owned in more leagues than the 14% he is right now. And uh, I'll add that if you're in a league that uses OBP instead of average, Alonso's walk rate cratered last year, but he does have a strong track record of, of working walks. So I, I would give him an even bigger boost in those unique leagues where you get uh where you're using OBP either in addition to or instead of, of batting average. At second base, I like Jace Peterson. Uh, he's batted first or second in each of the team's first three games. It appears Alberto Cayaspo sets to challenge Chris Johnson's playing time at third base more than that of Peterson at the second base like was expected initially. Uh, Peterson could be a great weapon in runs and stolen bases at least, and he does have the potential to hit for average as well if you make some improvements in his, in his major league profile this season. Yeah, and that lineup spot is really what, what appeals to me quite a bit. I mean, if you can get somebody at a middle infield position that's going to hit that high in the order, you're already ahead of the curve in, in, on uh, so many other players. At third base at 13% on, I like Will Meadowbrooks for San Diego. There's a question of how much he would play in San Diego due to the presence of Jan Hervis Solarte. So far, the former Red Sox player is, is hitting fifth while starting each game against lefty Clayton Kershaw and righties. Um, if he's playing every day, I mean, he, he could – he was an amazing player during his rookie season. You know, I think he hit 18 homers and a high average in about half a season's worth of at-bats. He's not going to be that good in San Diego, but he definitely deserves a spot on rosters if he's playing every day. 
And uh, I'm glad you brought up the, the lineup spot. He, in that retooled Padres lineup, he's going to be awarded RBI opportunities if he continues to slot there. And even though Petco Park isn't ideal for home run hitting, he does have above average power, and he does have a couple of favorable road venues within the division. At, at Chase Field and Coors Field both highlighted in today's podcast. So I do like Middlebrooks. Kind of has a very post-hype sleeper feel to him. So Middlebrooks is definitely a decent third base option. At shortstop, there weren't a great, a lot of great options that I liked. Uh, I went with Everett Cabrera. He's played in just one of the team's th- first three games. Uh, the Orioles have favored Ryan Flaherty and Jonathan Scope a little bit more. Um, Cabrera has the highest fantasy upside of those two middle infielders plus him. It's possible he gets more playing time uh, at second base by the time J.J. Hardy returns. Um, at the very least, he's a speed-worthy flyer you know, for an end bench spot. Yeah, and... Cabrera is actually a guy that's already been on and off and will probably be back on my roster in a 12-team head-to-head league um, as his his speed is appealing to me and I, I'm dealing with an, anth- an injury to Anthony Rendon there. So if you're looking to uh, maybe grab some cheap stolen bases early in the season or take a chance that he does end up supplanting Jonathan Scope at some point this year, Cabrera's, Cabrera certainly has... Uh, the skills necessary to really move the needle in a category. And, and it's rare to be able to find a middle infielder like that as widely available as Carrera is. Yeah. The guy that's been on my, off and on my roster early on, that's in that same one, one useful category uh, level as Jordan Schaefer. He's owned in 5% of leagues. He started each of the team's first two games going two for five at the plate. Um, his overall fantasy value is just, just in those stolen bases. I mean, he's hitting ninth in a bad lineup. He's not going to get you a lot of runs. He's not going to hit for a high average. But in five outfield leagues, he can help. If you need a speed boost in head-to-head leagues, he's going to help. So 5% is a little low to me. I think he, he could be a nice little weapon to use if when if and when he's needed in your team. Certainly. He, he fills a niche for teams, and that's, that's, that's important, especially in roto leagues where you can use every stolen base you can get, and you just can't afford to punk categories more or less. Another outfielder I, I mentioned is Drew Stubbs. He's 15% of leagues. Um, he's more, it, for those people that play fantasy football, they know they like to, to handcuff running backs. You know, if you have a very good offensive line, you like to take the, the backup running back as well as a starting running back and, and make sure that an injury doesn't kill you. Stubbs is that perfect kind of example for baseball leagues. He's a bench option on fantasy teams when everybody's healthy. Um, but for the guy that owns Corey Dickerson or that owns Carlos Gonzalez, um, or Blackman even, uh, he makes perfect sense, right? I mean, he if somebody goes down, he's going to be in that lineup, and he's going to be pr- pretty productive. He, he almost makes too much sense. It's funny that, that that's what you bring up in his write-up because I, going into my 12-team head-to-head keeper league draft, there's an owner that owns both Corey Dickerson and Charlie Blackman, and I pretty much just penciled him in for using one of his bench spots on Drew Stubbs. It just made so much sense, and yet Drew Stubbs is still sitting on the wire, and I'm kind of scratching my head like, why wouldn't you want to own him? Because you know Stubbs is going to get playing time, and of the outfielders, I would I would expect Blackman to probably get the most uh, days off against left-handed pitchers, but I wouldn't be shocked to see Dickerson get some. And as you said, Carlos Carlos Gonzalez, I mean, if nothing else, the, the, the Rockies should be looking to give him maintenance days. So Stubbs makes perfect sense as a handcuff for, for any of those outfielders, really. Yeah, Dickerson doesn't hit lefties well himself. I think he's actually um, on the bench today. I don't think he was in the starting lineup uh, Friday uh, against a lefty. So already it's starting with him. I mean, Stubbs is going to get his time regardless, but he's not a guy you can rely on on, an, on a day-to-day basis because you never know when that playing time is going to come. But especially if you own two Rockies outfielders, I mean, he, that's a guy you really want on your bench because you don't know what's going to happen with those guys and you want to cover the, those scenarios. Uh, moving on to my third outfielder, it's David Peralta. Um, the fact that the the Diamondbacks demoted Yasmani Tomas to start the season really helped out Jake Lamb's value, a guy we talked about earlier. But it also helped David Peralta. Um, that in the move of uh, Cody Ross getting off the roster too. I believe it was Cody Ross that got the designated for assignment there. Um, You're correct. The D-backs mix and match their outfielders over the first three games. Uh, Peralta's probably going to be in the lineup regularly against righties. Uh, he has the ability to break out in 2015, even if he's not going to play versus left-handers that much. I think in weekly leagues, if you see the, the Diamondbacks facing a bunch of righties one week, you should try to find a way to get Peralta in your, in your lineup. Definitely, and you have to love the lineup slot with Peralta. He hit uh, cleanup behind Paul Goldschmidt against uh, right-handed pitching in the early going. So I, I like the Peralta tout. Uh, he's, he's a really nice play in 
uh, leagues that allow daily changes because you can get him out of your lineup when when he is either getting a, a surprise day off against a righty or more likely sitting against left-handed pitching. My three starting pitchers, I, I like none of these guys I'm really dropping for um, for more established standard league guys right now. They're kind of guys I'm watching. But it's Brandon Morrow with the Padres, Aaron Harang with the, the Phillies, and Jordan Lyles with the Rockies. Uh, Morrow struggled over the last two years. He's dealt with uh, tons of injuries, but he won the fifth spot in the Padres rotation. He's in a great situation for his fantasy value, you know, as always, as long as he can stay healthy. Yeah, I mean, you have to love Petco Park. It, it does wonders for mediocre pitchers. And when Morrow's really clicking, I mean, the upside's fairly high with him. I, I wouldn't obviously uh, race out to get him. As you said, I, I'm not cutting anybody just yet for him. But he's a guy that, based on his ballpark alone, uh, you have to like the upside this year. And when you factor in uh, his, his actual pitching skills when he's going right, it's hard not to like Morrow. Uh, Harang is a guy I probably should have given more stock to going into the year. Um, he's shining in season debut Wednesday. I'm not I'm not going to go out and drop a good player to pick him up off of one start. But he added a cutter to his arsenal last year. He had pretty good numbers with the Braves. Um, he was using it again against the Red Sox. I mean, he, he mixes pitches very well. I think he has maybe even five pitches. He's either four or five pitches that he mixes pretty well. And he's not terrible with any of them. Um, he, he, he's, shown, he's a veteran. He's shown the ability to keep batters off balance. Um, that kind of comes into play when you're going through a lineup more than twice. Some of the younger guys that, that rely on stuff with two or even three pitches to get through a lineup kind of run out of what they're going to do with that stuff by the time it's the third time through the lineup and you get a guy like Giancarlo Stanton coming up, he's going to take you deep. Uh, Har Harang, I'm less worried about that happening. I think he has enough different versatility in his pitches and the acumen to use him in the right situations that he could go deeper in the starts and still be as good in the fifth, sixth, seventh innings as he is in the second, third, and fourth. And he's the type of glue guy, large mixed league or NL only rotation that is nifty to use in the right venues. You won't necessarily want to use him against fly ball hitting teams at home, given the uh, home run amplifying ways of Citizens Bank Park. But I mean, he's he's shown that he's a capable pitcher. And as you said, he can go through lineups multiple times. And uh, you have to value guys like that in deep mixed leagues where the options are just kind of uh, limited, really. And the third guy, Jordan Lyles, is a guy I was just irrationally high on for whatever reason coming into the season. I'm not willing to give that up yet. Uh, he's focused on developing a split finger changeup. It should help keep the hitters off balance. Hopefully get him more strikeouts and less long at-bats. Um, he did a fine job in the season debut despite not getting a bunch of strikeouts. I think he had just two. Um, and I like him at least for road starts going forward. Um, he has two road starts coming up before he has to pitch in Coors Field. So at least for the next week to week and a half, I like him. Yeah, and the thing for Lyles, uh, the thing that I would monitor most closely is his platoon split. He is death on righties already. If he can make any gains against left-handed pitching, a um, uh, guy that comes to mind immediately for me is Rick Porcello. Porcello used to get hammered by left-handed pitching, did very well, or left-handed hitting, I should say, did very well against lefties last year. And I think Lyles could be that kind of pitcher if he can just close the gap on his platoon split. Yeah, that's a good call. And Porcello just got $82 million over four years, so um, that that should give Lyles plenty of incentive yeah. to improve against lefties. Uh, the two relievers I highlighted were Chris Hatcher in, in Los Angeles with the Dodgers and Adam Adam Ottavino with the Rockies. Uh, Hatcher picked up his first save of the season for the Dodgers. He could continue to be the preferred option. Uh, he struggled Tuesday. The Dodgers didn't use him Wednesday when they found another situation because you don't want to use him three days in a row anyway. So Peralta came in and and, uh, and got the save there. Um, it's possible they mix and match the two closers. Obviously, either one of those guys is going to be a, a, a long-term option because Kenley Jansen is going to come back at some point. But um, for those people that are chasing saves right now, I mean, Hatcher has the ability to get three or four of them you know, in the next few weeks. Yeah, and I mean, every save counts, and, and grabbing a guy like Hatcher who's already gotten a save under his belt and ha has proven that, that manager Don Mattingly trusts him in the ninth inning, uh, you, you kind of got to grab saves where you can get them, and at least Hatcher's got a live arm. I, I like the endorsement. And as far as Adovino goes, he's the eighth inning guy there. Um, Hawkins blew a save uh, in the first week, and Axford got the save uh, on top of that, I believe. And um, in, in Colorado, obviously, um, Adovino had already pitched, so he couldn't come in and get the save again. I think if they have to turn away from Hawkins because of either injury or poor play, Adovino will be the guy there. 
Um, and he might even, if they don't have to uh, move away from Hawkins, Ottavino could still get some saves because the Rockies shouldn't be pitching Hawkins on back-to-back -back days. I thought that that was going to be a focus of them not to do that, and then first time out, they went ahead and used him on consecutive days, and he got blown up. So um, so Ottavino is at least going to collect some saves here and there, I think, while uh, Hawkins rests, and he has the ability and the potential in that situation to run away with the job in the second half of the season. Yeah, and uh, the the days of Rex Brothers being the closer and waiting are, are over with him in AAA right now. Adovino is definitely the name to to like in that bullpen beyond Hawkins. And life as a Rockies closer is tough. I mean, pitching at Coors Field, it's very and he he didn't even blow his save at home. He blew it at at Miller Park. So uh, a couple ugly outings, and it could be Adovino's job to run away with. Yeah, so that's that's basically all I have for you from the pickups that I like and um, what everybody else is doing in their fantasy leagues. Yeah, and uh, I mean that that really brings me to the the talk the the talking point right now, uh, and that's that's how do you handle the early season? What what are some rules of thumb that you follow uh, in terms of cutting struggling players early, uh, grabbing hot free agents? I mean. What are some things that, that you're looking for? What are some things that will prompt you to, to act on, on changing your roster? I mean, we're not even a full week into the season, and, and all you have to do is hop on Twitter, and, and you'll immediately see a million questions directed at experts about, should I cut struggling Pablo Sandoval for, uh, you know, whatever hot name is off to a scorching start in the season? And the obvious answer is no, but, but, but what are some rules of thumb that you have? Yeah, the main one is is read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, where they tell you don't panic because <laughs> it, if this happened, you know, in in a week in, week in late June in a three day stretch, you know, nobody would give any consideration. Like somebody has a bad three day stretch in June, but because it happened right at the outset of the season, uh, people tend to give it a little more weight than than it needs. Um, there's going to be players who struggle early and continue to struggle, but there's going to be even more who write the ship and go on to have the seasons that we expected. I have a dynasty league where a bunch of my pitchers got hurt during the spring. Two guys I targeted to help fill the void were Graveman, who was terrible, and Bud Norris, who was terrible Friday. Um, most pitchers have a few bad starts during the year, you know, even the best of them. I'm not going to cut bait with either guy right away just to get them off my team for the sake of getting them off my team. Um, I'd only drop them to add a player I considered in that same tier of talent if that player is available and if for whatever reason I, I've, I've upped their long-term viability more than the guys I have. But I won't get rid of them to add someone like Kyle Kendrick or Edison Volquez based on one start. Uh, on the on the flip side of that, because some people are giving more weight to early performances, um, it's possible that there are early buy low trades available in leagues, uh, uh, trade possibilities um, for those guys that have really underperformed. Not a guy that's like two for nine, but a guy that's like zero oh for eleven. Like I really like Chris Carter and his power output coming into the season, but he's yet to record a hit going into Friday. Uh, if I happen to miss him in a league, I'd go ahead and float a lower tier outfielder who's playing pretty well in a trade proposal to his owner just to see what happens. You know, in this example, maybe someone like a Lorenzo Cain or an Alex Rios, guys that I don't think have a huge upside but are obviously playing better than Carter is right now. Maybe his owner's going to panic and trade him low, and, and I have a guy that I really like for the last 24 weeks of the season. You know. Yep, and I think the perfect scenario there is where you have a category that you know that that owner uh, maybe has a void in, that, that they came out of the draft a little light on. You might be able to paddle, say, some stolen bases that either you have excess of or you have enough of to buy, to buy low, and it doesn't necessarily feel like a buy low at that point um, for the other owner. They don't, they don't feel like they're getting ripped off or like they're being... Um, targeted for for this buy low it just they, they can at that point they can almost rationalize it as well i'm going to trade chris carter's power for stolen bases i came out of the draft a little bit light there and from your point of view you're getting a higher ranked player uh that that, that you liked more coming into the draft and you're not already saddled with his 0 for 11 you're going to get that production that you were expecting most likely i mean and, and carter's a perfect example he's a three true he's a three true outcomes outfielder he's going to go through bad stretches and as you said if this is june nobody's going to think anything of a, an 0 for 11 from chris carter because he strikes out quite a bit he's a low average hitter but you're paying for his power and you're going to run into those uh, dry spells yeah, so I think that's what I'm doing in leagues right now. I'm, I'm sending trade offers for those guys that I missed out on on the drafts that are underperforming. And the guys that I missed out on that I really wanted that aren't underperforming, I'm kind of hoping that they start underperforming soon so I can send offers for them too. Definitely. Um, a couple things that I, that I like to look for very early in the season are, are those those 
first lineup slots for guys. Uh, Travis Snyder is a guy that immediately comes to mind. Opened up on opening day, hitting fifth. Buck Showalter rewarded him for one good game by moving him up to third in the order. I, I think that that might be overstating why Buck did it. Um, I'm guessing he wanted to split up Chris Davis and uh, Travis Snyder, a couple of left-handed hitters, and split up his righties as well because he has uh, Steve Pierce hitting second, Travis Snyder hitting third, Adam Jones, a right-handed batter, hitting fourth. So kind of split those guys up, but that's the type of thing that that definitely impacts value. Mike Bostakis hitting second was a bit of a shocker to me. Uh, definitely helps his value quite a bit. Any of these premium lineup slots in the top five, if a guy gets moved up there that I didn't expect to be there, I suddenly have to reassess their value because um, part, of, part of the preseason rankings is making an educated guess on lineups, making an educated guess on runs and RBI, and that's tough to do without knowing lineup slot. You can, you can make a more educated prognostication on home runs and stolen bases because those skills aren't reliant on the rest of the lineup. But once you see a lineup change, like that's, that's something that, that tends to move the needle for me. And uh, as you mentioned with people overreacting and, and buy low trades, this is a nice time that you might actually see some guys getting cut from some, some overreacting owners. At that point, when I see somebody cut, I immediately go back to my preseason rankings and say, where was this guy ranked? Did I have him higher than somebody else that I already own on the roster? Is it worth making that 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 swap? Right, and then talking about lineup spots in particular, um, I like what they did with Travis Snyder. Um, I think that day it was really lefty, righty, lefty, righty, all the way down one through nine. And it, in Chris Davis's first day back, I know you really don't want to hit him third. I think in the best of no. situations, <laughs> you don't want to hit him third. He hit 196 last year. He's a great power hitter, but um, you're, you're giving up too many outs if that's the hitter he's going to be coming into the season. So it is possible that Snyder sticks there in that third spot for a little while, at least until Matt Wieters comes back and they have to shuffle the lineup a little bit more. Yep. Um, beyond that, I, I mean, there there aren't really any other hard and fast rules that I have. Uh, as you said, don't panic. It's early in the season. The sample sizes are tiny. And, and basically, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You did all that research going into the draft. Trust that research. I mean, 11 plate appearances isn't changing what your research. Unless a player's injured, unless their role has changed, unless their lineup slot has changed, unless a guy's gotten booted from the rotation, there's not really a reason to go overboard assessing things. I mean, if all of a sudden you notice that a pitcher's velocity is way down, then you've got some reassessing to do. But beyond that, I mean, trust your rankings. You put too much time into them and, and, and did too much to immediately just abandon the draft, abandon your strategy, and, and chase the the next Chris Shelton of the world. I mean, nobody wants to be the guy that that boots a, a high round pick or a mid round pick for a hot streak that that isn't sustainable. Yeah, the only guys I'm cutting right now are end of the roster type guys that I picked for um may, maybe multi position eligibility to help at one at, at back up a few positions, but then I found someone else I like like for example, I had a league where I drafted Luis Valbuena late. He's eligible at second and third. And then I went and picked up Odebel Herrera. Um, who went to the, dra the, the draft un unclaim, undrafted. Um, so then I took that spot with Valbuena, could use it on a better third baseman, you know, and I didn't have any particular claim to, to hang on to Valbuena. I don't think he's going to be amazing this year. So I was okay with cutting him to pick to, to turn a roster spot or to try to find a better backup third baseman or a better um, uh, pitching. If I, need, I think in that league I had a couple guys on the DL, so I needed pitching. So that's the type of guy I'm cutting. I'm not cutting guys like, uh, you know, 10th, 11th, 12th round picks just because they have a few bad games. Exactly. Now let's close the show as we always do with three questions from the Fantasy Baseball Cafe forums. The first is submitted by user Dylan Lockwood. In a 10-team head-to-head league, should Dylan Lockwood uh, use the second waiver claim that they possess on one of Masahiro Tanaka, Neil Walker, or Jared Weaver? Uh, they were all dropped by, by one owner. Uh, Dylan Lockwood, to give you some, some roster idea of what, what they own, uh, they have Jason Kipnis and Brian Dozier at second base, and they're fairly deep at starting pitcher with Max Scherzer, Carlos Carrasco, Lance Lynn, Derek Holland, who left today's start. I assume Derek Holland because um, they didn't list a first name and they only listed starting pitching. If that's Greg Holland. Um, he's not going anywhere. Jesse Hahn, John Lackey, Dallas Keuchel, Carlos Martinez, and a couple of DL stashes in Drew Smiley and, and, and Homer Bailey. Are, are you making um, a, a cut for for any of those three players that were were dropped? Well, it kind of depends for me. If, if I'm looking at this league and if I've played in this league before and um, I think that other 
similarly valued players are going to come come onto the wire pretty soon. I think I'd pass on using the waiver claim, um, and that's just be, that's just in anticipation of the talent that could be available to be picked up. Like a guy like Chris Carter, if he does get cut because he's being because un- he's underperforming, I grab him over those guys. I think he has a lot more upside to help you in head-to-head leagues. Um, that being said, if you don't think that's going to happen, I'd certainly grab Sanaka or Weaver for for Holland, for Lackey, for even Jesse Hahn if they pass. Uh, if, if if he wants to use that waiver claim, and if not, I'd grab him if they pass through waivers. Yeah, that's that's a really key distinction. Um, if you've been in the league and you know the owners and you have some inkling of an idea that uh, another similarly talented player that that you have ranked higher might get caught. Uh, Shedding that number two waiver claim to get one of these guys doesn't feel necessary, but I'm with you. Tanaka, for me, I like better than Weaver. I don't like Weaver's diminished velocity. Tanaka's is obviously down as well, but at least we have an explanation that he's throwing his two-seamer more. Um, I think we, I think Tanaka's ceiling is higher than Weaver's, and in a 10-team league where you have so much available talent on the wire, I, I don't mind cutting a guy like Lackey or, as you said, Derek Holland, especially if the injury, I have a shoulder tightness is what I had heard before hopping on the podcast. If that turns out to be serious, Holland's an obvious cut. Um, and, and if uh, you you are concerned that somebody might be- somebody better might be cut and that waiver claim is going to have more value than using now, then hope that one of these guys gets through uh, waivers and, and claim a guy like, uh, grab a guy like Tanaka once he clears and uh, swap him in for, for an injured Holland or Lackey. Yeah, I think I would take Weaver over Tanaka. I'm not too concerned about the the velocity. Weaver is a guy that hasn't blown people away with his stuff in years, and he's he still managed to be successful. Tanaka just seems to me like he's going to have season-ending surgery at some point. You know, I just don't see that ending well when you partially tear your UCL and then you rehab it without surgery. So I say he's going to like it's 100 percent. It's obviously not 100 percent, but he has a much higher injury possibility than a lot of other pitchers. So if I have a talented guy, I'm choosing between between him and, and that other guy. I'm going to go with that other guy, and I think Weaver is a little bit better than just replacement level in a 10-team league. That, that's a fair stance. Um, the next question is submitted by Friedrich15 in a 14-team 5x5 keeper league where three closers can be started. Uh, Friedrich15 is looking to move one of five closers to stash Hyunjin Ryu. The owner of Ryu gave gave Friedrich the option to deal whichever closer they want in return for you. Um, the five closers who are on uh, Friedrich's roster are Santiago Casilla, Latroy Hawkins, Yuri's Familia, Steve Ciszek, and uh, let's see, and Ca- uh, Mr. Castro there in in Toronto. Uh, would you move any of these five for Ryu, and uh, which of the five would you be most inclined to move? Yeah, if it was, if I had to, I'd move four of them for Ryu. Um, <laughs> I don't, I don't mind moving Casilla. Um, I definitely move Hawkins, Familia, or Castro. Um, uh, obviously, you have the option of picking any one of them. So if there's a way to move Hawkins, Familia, or Castro and get a little bit more on top, I would try to do that. Um, I think CSEC is a top 10 closer. I wouldn't part with him because he has been good enough early on that, that he shouldn't be in that group with those other guys. Um, the other guys aren't really long-term closers to me. I, I think I'd probably move Familia. And then um, I turn around, and if I could get something for Castro, because his value I think right now is as high as it's possibly going to be, I I try to move him to get a, a a more stable closer, or at least sell high in a different position with him too. Yeah, I'm I'm in agreement. Familia feels like the guy that that's the one that I would move the most. I mean, if for whatever reason you make that offer and they decide that they want to counter with Hawkins or Castro or Casilla, feel, feel free to swap any of them. Point being, getting Ryu as a stash is a coup, basically, for what you're going to have to give up. Um, and really, one of those closers is not like the other, and that's Steve Ciszek. As long as he's not being bandied about in that trade, you can move any of them. But if I'm picking one, Familia is the guy that I'm moving. I agree. The uh, last question comes to us from Bardu. This is a straightforward question. They own Perkins and Ciszek. Would you add Andrew Miller or Miguel Castro? The option is apparently there to add both, too. Uh, who is your pick, and would you be bending over to – uh, backwards to add both? Um, I wouldn't bend over backwards to add both in every scenario. Miller definitely has to be owned at this point. 
Um, he he's going to obviously he's sharing the role at the very least uh, with the Yankees right now. He's a good enough pitcher that I don't see him losing any any smidgen of the role he has. The only thing that that could be to his detriment is the light going on for Dylan Batances, his mechanical adjustments kicking in, and he just starts blowing people away that that the Yankees feel they can't help but to give him the closer role. Um, until that happens, Miller might be the full time closer. At the very least, he's going to be a co closer. So I think he's got to be owned because he's going to help ratios, he's going to help strikeouts, and he's going to get saves too. He's the perfect relief pitcher to have on your team, even if he's not a quote-unquote full-time closer. Um, Castro's worth, worth picking up if that roster spot is there, if if players, if players, managers have it. I would expect Cecil to be back in the closer role within about two weeks. He was just behind in his preparation, um, recovering from injury, going into the season, so it's not surprising that he doesn't have his best stuff in the first few days of the season. I think they want him to close full-time. I think that it's not a case where they need him in a setup role as their only quality lefty. They have Aaron Loop that could also pitch in a setup role with, with C-Sheck as the uh, – I mean, not Cecil, as Cecil as the as the primary closer. So it's not a situation like Tampa, where I feel like Brad Boxberger could run away with the job because Tampa really doesn't have another lefty besides Jake McGee um, that that they can rely on out of the bullpen. So I could definitely see a guy like McGee moving to a setup role if Boxberger proves capable in the ninth inning. Um, that's not the case in Toronto. Uh, loops there. Cecil, I think, is going to close full time. So Castro is good to own now, but I'd be selling high on him in most leagues, even where I could grab him. Yeah, I'll echo your sentiments on Miller. He absolutely needs to be added right now. He's a slam, ju- slam dunk choice if you have to choose between the two. Um, if you have a very um, mediocre player at the end of your bench, we don't we don't know the league size. We don't know what could possibly be cut. If you have an extra roster spot maybe from putting a guy on the DL and you can add both, Castro looks good. If the last guy on your roster is basically trash, I would grab Castro. The, th- the thinking being that, I'm with you, RJ. I think Cecil recaptures that closer's job after he gets settled in. But if Castro gets off to a good start, maybe you can sell him for more than whatever that la- whoever that last player is on your roster. So if you're adding him for the price of free or basically close to free, then I see no reason not to add Castro. But Miller's the guy to go get um, if you're if you're only choosing between one of the two. And that's going to do it for today's MLB Rundown. I hope you enjoyed the show, and you'll be back next week. Uh, thank you, as as always, for hopping on, RJ. It's been fun. Thanks, man. I'm just glad I got through it without sounding like I caught the zombie flu. I've been coughing for like 24 hours straight, so I spent the whole podcast chewing on cough drops. Uh, it might have made me a little hard to understand at some points, but at least you didn't have to hear me hacking and coughing the whole time. I, I, I'd say... Uh, you played well hurt today because I wouldn't have I wouldn't have known any different if you hadn't said anything. So hat tip to you, RJ. Thanks. All right, take care, man. You too.